great. So we're recording everybody. I'm really glad to welcome you all to our Open Data Day, Open Data Week event with um, about Open Green Map 2. Um, it's exciting that this is a local and global event. Um, we're local and global too. In fact, we've been saying think global, map local for 25 years. Um, today, um, we're going to start with Bogdan and Alexandra talking from the GIS Collective. We'll be introducing um, the platform, followed by me. Um, and then we're going to hear from Mary Hunt. Um, and you're going to hear from me why this is such a good match for us and how much we love working with this team. Um, Mary's going to be talking about what a difference this has made for her community in the Pacific Northwest. So, um, oh, shoot, I forgot to share my screen. Um, <laughs> here we go. Um, oops, let me find the show. There we are. Can you all see that? And everybody's got the screen share going? Yes. Great. Okay, and um, now we're about to, um, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Alexandra and Bogdan, and um, really, thank you to these amazing people from the GIS Collective. Thanks, Wendy. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, me and Bogdan represent GIS Collective. Um, I'm going to cover um, a bit more of, of a technical side of um, our platform. So we're building an open source geodata platform that's used by GreenMap for their projects. Uh, and it's their um, new version of the open green map uh, platform. Um, next slide, please, Wendy. Yeah, thanks. So to make uh, our idea with the project was to make uh, mapping accessible so that People don't need to have GIS and mapping knowledge to be able to collaborate and make community maps or any other type of maps that they might want to publish as open data. So um, if someone wants the help of maps to do projects like monitoring for ecological or scientific purposes or uh, do conservation or do crowdsourcing, they shouldn't need to have to learn a whole new domain, GIS, to be able to do that. And that's why a core part of our approach is to grow the platform together with the people who use it so that it truly fits their need. And we've been collaborating very closely with GreenMap. Next slide, please. Uh, so in order to be open and accessible, we need to focus on a few aspects that are central to uh, actually enable people to, as many people as possible, to make use of the platform. So our priorities are first to make the platform easy to deploy and scale so that, that if you want to host the app yourself or if your project gets bigger over time, you can accommodate that. Um, second, we want to um, cover a lot of use cases. So whether your data is about green places in an urban setting or trees or insects around your village, you should be able to make a custom form uh, and to be able to collect data for that without having to know uh, database uh, quirks or have any general databases knowledge. And third, we want to be able to uh, people to be able to contribute and access the data from home or the office as well as when they're on the go. And finally, for cases when you want to collect data in a remote location where you don't have internet coverage, we want to be able to offer offline capabilities. Now, these are uh, our guiding principles. We haven't already covered all of them in the current version of the platform, but uh, we are working towards building that. Next slide, please. Oop. Sorry. So how does the platform currently work? We have a web app available um, and uh, for green map, people can access it at new.opengreenmap.org. Um, to add their own project, uh, people first need to make an account. They need to create a team because 
the team uh, is the entity that controls the access to the map and manages the map data. Then you need to create a map where you can add your sites or routes or areas. Uh, and we've also recently released a campaigns feature with which uh, you can basically simplify the contribution form if you want to engage others that are outside your core team in collecting the data. And that's it, you're ready to start mapping. So uh, next slide here, I want to uh, quickly highlight a few features that we have that enable the use and creation of open data with the GIS Collective platform. Uh, so we're, we're going to go through all of these. Uh, next slide, I think you can go to the map license. So you can add a license for your map data. This way others will know how they can use the data you contribute with. And here is an example of a map which has a Creative Commons license set. So you set the license name and link and you can see that directly on the map, uh, we have a label with a link to the license use. So it's very clear how you can use the data from that map. And then next. Uh, icons are a central part of the platform and Green Map have uh, created and provided to the community an amazing set of icons. So what we want to do with the platform is to offer further possibilities for people to extend these icons and to use them for their particular use case. So for example, maybe you want to use one of the icons, but uh, your project asks for a different color theme. You can extend an existing icon like this one with blue, uh, with a blue color, and you upload the extended version in a different color. And then when people filter by or search the initial icon, they will also find data that, that matches both the initial and the one you extended. Uh, next. Uh, icons also have attributes, which um, their, their goal is to shape how the data you collect looks like. So let's say you would want to map B data from your area. Maybe you want uh, that people use, who use your B icon fill in certain uh, data for, for every observation. So you might want them to fill a species name for the beehive they are mapping and other specific data. And with, uh, by defining these attributes, you can set up a set of questions that contributors will get in the form. Um, and also use a variety of data types so that you're sure that you don't get uh, erroneous data. For example, when you want um, a number, you don't get a text. Uh, next. Right, so we're talking here about open data, but when you work with open data, sometimes there are parts of the data that you want to be able to review or to control access to uh, because in some situations you have uh, sensitive data or you may have other constraints. So instead of restricting access to the whole data set, you can share it in a responsible way. Uh, here are some of the features we have uh, and we're working on to offer. So uh, data uh, can be masked, the location can be masked for example, when you want to map certain species that are protected and you don't want everyone to know exactly where they are, you can show the area in which they are, but you don't have uh, the exact location. Uh, when you have uh, data that maybe you want to make public only after review, you can set different statuses for it. And coming soon, we will also allow for parts of the, the data for a site, for example, to be private and parts of it to be public. Uh, next. Yeah, so download formats. Of course, data is open if you have access to it on your own terms. So we don't plan to lock people in to access it only from our platform. Uh, we offer several formats for downloading your data. Uh, so if some projects would like to make it easy to share data with others. We also offer the possibility to include these download buttons for your map directly there, which makes it very easy to share. And next slide, finally, 
We also support many types of base maps, including OpenStreetMap. So you can basically customize the background for the data that you want to collect. You can also layer them. For example, if you have your own, your pro and you have your own geo server wow. and you already created base maps, then you can use that as a layer on top of other uh, OpenStreetMap tiles. And you can also use maps created on the GIS Collective platform as base maps. Uh, next. So finally, here is some contact information from us and links to get more info. And I will pass it on to Wendy now to talk more about the Green Map project. Thank you so much, Alexandra. That was really exciting. As always, I learn from every time um, a member of this team speaks, there's something new and exciting that we can do with the platform. So thank you so much. Um, by the way, um, we'll hold questions till after Mary speaks and there'll be about 20, 25 minutes to have a discussion and talk then. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Green Maps Road to Open. Um, as mentioned, we're 25 years old um, and um, we represent a diverse user group, which is really important for a new platform to have. We're all contributing locally towards a better planet. We practice, as you can see from these images that are from um, city agencies, universities, grassroots groups, kids groups, all kinds of people lead these projects and their strategies and also their requests are really important towards making um, OGM more flexible and usable. Um, we've learned so much from all of these practitioners over the years and really try and share their strategies in different ways. Um, we've created a whole group of tools together um, what we're doing is we're connecting projects and sharing those strategies. We're also collecting, assessing, and sharing the outcomes and creating these new tools. And we found that our open and adaptable tools are really adding value to these locally determined map making processes. Um, I want to point out the um, app right in the middle that was made by Bogdan and um, Ciprian Samuila about. 2014 for our previous mapping platform. So there was an open green map one. Oh, you'll see it in a moment. Um, that helped really inform what you're seeing in an open green map two. Okay. Our, from the beginning though, back in 1995, we were built on universals. Maps are trustable guides. They're usable by all. They're a uh, kind of universal design. Maps change our perception. I consider them power tools. And we use the icons to do more than just identify and promote. They also link green space places. And especially when about sustainability, how it's continually evolving, it's really important that places can learn from one another. We release the initial font, uh, the initial set of icons as a font, and that made it very easy for new people to the internet. And as you can imagine, in 1996, that was everybody. So for lots of people, this was their first time using information technology to support sustainability in their own community. Um, you can see all the categories that are in our current set of 170 icons. This is what the set looks like today. Um, and it's now uh, under Creative Commons 4.0 license. Um, and the main, it's in three main categories, green living, nature, culture, and society. We um, are really excited about um, icon, um, locally made icons. And we've, when we created this set of icons, we made an underlying pattern language that helps people make local icons that harmonize with the global. And down in the uh, lower right corner, you can see one we made for bike share here in New York for one of the maps we needed. We didn't have that icon. Um, oops. Our website, um, greenmap.org, is story-based at this point. So if you want to hear from the map makers about what they created and what difference it made, come and take a look. I encourage you to explore. Lots of good tools up there for engagement as well. 
Um, and you can get an inkling of the hundreds of print maps that have been created over the years. You can see me on the lower uh, right, I'm taking about 600 printed editions and um, a couple hundred locally made um, tools and promotion devices that are all now part of the New York Public Library Map Room collection. So that's where Archive is based. Um, we're going to do, be doing more to make it visible online in the coming months, I hope. Um, it was 2012 that I went to Open Knowledge Fest in Helsinki with Cindy Kotala, who's Green Map Helsinki. And it really opened my eyes to this potential of what Open could do for Green Map. And after that experience came back and we created this roadmap and really started thinking about all the aspects we'd have to address. And I'm very happy that by the end of 2018, we were ready to announce we were open with this license. And then we added a plus CC, which allows commercial with reciprocity. Um, and this is the image that we put out when we went open in 2018, that we were not a startup, but we were a start open. So we kind of created a, a new phrase for groups like ours that were moving from the old way of doing things to the new way of doing things. And you can see our keywords around climate and partnerships, synergy, and doing more to connect and uh, contribute. Um, so um, it's been ex very exciting over, in the couple years since then, especially because of Open Green Map 2. And this has really been a thrilling experience for me to get to know the GIS Collective better and to see how they work with our massive um, amount of differences. And they, down on the right, um, is how they've sorted out, helped people who come to the platform, find the maps they want, understand the different icon sets, and then start delving into the sites. And down the left side are the features, and Alexandra mentioned several of them. I love that this web app works on all devices, and it's really that it's got import and export and embed. These are all things that people really wanted um, to have on the um, the next platform, that we can add sounds and multiple images to sites, expand the storytelling. And of course, I'm very excited about the icon features that, they've, that Alexandra told us about. We've already added the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as an icon set, so you could put them right on your map. We've also matched them to our own icon set. So help people understand what are these United Nations global goals mean in the local context. Um, in 2020, we created another set of icons that did part of what Alexandra was talking about, where we repurposed some of our own icons and created some new ones um, with the help of our network to um, support recovery. So public health, recuperation, and regeneration is the theme of that set. You can mix any of these icon sets on the platform. So it can add a lot of richness and depth to your map. Um, so for me, the uses of this platform include all the different ways you might use a map to explore and discover. And um, it's about data collection. It's about planning and advocacy, helping people see what is coming. It helps people get engaged, especially young people or new people to the community in place-based learning, sustainability, and of course, it increases everybody's technology mastery. Um, there's ways to sort so you can research best practices really quickly. It's really wonderful for sharing stories of place. I'm putting on the left side, I mean on the right side, what Mary showed me just last night. She uses a tool called Snagit and could make a giant poster of all her sites in seconds. And good chance that this will show up in the schools um, in their community. And I also really like the brand new campaigns feature, which allows a lot of people to get involved very quickly and to get quick insights. So we're about to move on to Mary's talk. I really I like her map so much. It's been very exciting. Um, and on this page, we have three views of it. 
one is it appears when you first arrive on, on, this, on the map. The upper right is when you've clicked open one of the sites and you can see the images, the icons, and start to get the understanding of what's going on there. The lower left shows you a close up of just downtown Port Townsend, Washington, where um, there's a lot, of, lot going on, of course, that you can zoom in and the icons stop covering each other up and you see there's more and more there. Terrific. Um, we're gonna be doing more demos on how to use the platform. We post them on greenmap.org slash stories slash OGM2 and of course on our social media. Um, but now I'm gonna stop my screen and turn it over to Mary on, so she can um, show us how this has mattered locally. Okay, thanks Wendy. Hello all, um, okay, let's bring this up. This little box out of the way, hit that. All righty. So welcome all. I'm kind of the in-between person. I've been a uh, program manager, marketing kind of person all my life. And I've always been in the middle between technology and the user and trying to make sense of it for both ends and then have it work and go through and not clog up and stop and, and waste valuable time. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit on this. And let's see, it's not, my screen is not going to the next one. We see them. Ah, oh, okay, hold on. There we go. Okay. Wrong arrow. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go over this a couple of times because for me, I was looking at all the mapping platforms that were out there. I've been through the software wars since you know late 90s through the two, 2000s and what can stop a project in the middle of everything. So for me personally, it had to be open source, user-friendly, flexible. The library of ideas that Green Map has was really important to me because I'm working with schools and people need to see that this was not a brand new thing, they may die tomorrow. It's been along for a long time, so it had legs. And that help was available. Uh, one person person here uh, is a volunteer trying to make that happen. My users, same thing. <laughs> they wanna make sure it was open source, they didn't wanna pay a lot of money, they wanted it friendly, flexible, all those kind of things were important to them as well. So that was great. So here's a little port towns in the middle of uh, nowhere in the Northwest. And um, the big thing that we had going up here is food security and trying to get our brains around the uh, farms that we have around here, which we have close to 15 organic farms and getting that food to the schools and getting it to the markets and what that all means. So for me, this is open source. You can choose from anything in the world to do. And, but we had to come down and this is about taking everything you can do and bringing it down to something that is actually usable for people. So we chose schools. This is the farm to fork program. Everything starts with the kids. People wanna support kids. They wanna give money to kids and the programs that they're doing. If we can train that next group, then they can take it along all the way through the food chain around here. What's nice on here now is that, thank you very much guys at GIS for putting up a search bar up here. Seems kind of obvious, um, wasn't there to begin with um, because you can search by text or you can search by icon. And when you can search by text, the text is either in the title or any text that's on the on the thing. So it makes it really useful. I type in school. Finn River Farms doesn't um, isn't a school, but it serves as schools. So it's just a way of slicing and dicing information very quickly and makes it more interactive for the kids when they get going. When we finally get going again, because unfortunately, um, COVID happened, <laughs> just as this was getting to be released, schools closed down, they're still closed down. So we're doing things in the background to make it better. And then the other part is the icon filters and the filter that turns to an X after you hit the filter, when you click on that, um, okay, let me put this back over on this side. Then you can at least see immediately where that school is when you click on the green school filter. You can add how many filters do you, or how many icons can we do at once if we want to do a search? One to 10, one to 20, unlimited? As many Whatever. as you want. Many as you want. So. Of those 2000 icons, the ones that show up here are the ones that I have chosen to work with me. I don't have all 200, uh, 2000, all 200 icons. I have only maybe 50 that are on here, sorry. <laughs> so when you type, when you click up sustainable living, this is not live, um, it'll drop down just the icons for that. The eco information is just the ones that I've chosen for my map. So it doesn't get overwhelming. Oops. 
And here we go. All right, so getting started on this, you guys are probably like me, you wear a lot of hats. You're either gonna be doing this all yourself from start to finish and you are the go-to person or you're gonna be working with a team where someone saw a green map and went, wow, that's great. Let's get somebody going to work together. Now you gotta work with the whole team. I find it easier because I've always worked on my own just to kind of plow through all this information I'm gonna give you in a second because it's all in my head. But when you're working with a team, you have to systemize, as you know, things in organizations as you go along so you don't waste time. So both of them require creating a message, a logo, taglines, format, getting your parameters set and taking that big world of open source information down to a very specific mission that you want to do. And you'll save yourself a lot of heartache and frustration in the long run if you do that. So in the bottom line is a format for each site. Um, Green Map used to have a fill in the blank thing for your information and now it's totally open. So it's flexible to whatever you want to put in there. But with that, you still kind of need to set what bullet points and information you want to put from one site to the next. And I'll show you why that's important in just a second. And the same thing for pictures and sounds and the next steps. This is interesting. It does not want to go to the next screen. There we go. Um, so first things first, you know, you're talking with your organization, I'm speaking with my marketing hat on, I want to and refine down again what people want to do. Green Map, as you saw, can do a lot of things for a lot of different reasons. But if you get people to talk about maybe the top two things they're trying to achieve, that's going to really help you in the long run to figure out what you're going to put in and what you're going to leave out. And then keep it as simple as possible. We're on Zoom right now because Zoom is very simple and that's why it's been so effective. So then you want to speak to the person that you are interfaced with the most and, um, and find out where they're at. You know, in the case of administrator, they want it open source, friendly, flexible. They may not be touching it themselves, but they know the next person needs it open source, user friendly and flexible. So that is important. Marketing person definitely wants it user friendly and flexible to grow with their program, whatever it is. And tech people, of course, open source and flexible have been important things on that. Just whoever you're talking to, try and match the language up along with the mission and you'll pull this thing along a lot faster. To that end, what I did with the wellness, the Jefferson County Wellness Project. This is an ad hoc group of uh, five people on a board and they funnel a lot of money into the Farm to Fork program around Fort Townsend. And to get them to make a logo meant they had to make all those decisions. What are they gonna call it? What are they gonna emphasize? Lots of decisions are made to get that logo. So when I asked them to do that first, that cut through a lot of the chit chat to get to this. And now they can set their actual mission and parameters. And I'm gonna stay here for just a second because this one's really quite important. Um, what is the wellness project? Was it the wellness project or was it gonna be called Feed Jeffco? Choose one. And they decided to go with Feed Jeffco as an umbrella, as a, a project under the umbrella community wellness project. So that was a big decision. They want to empower and educate students and families. That was a big decision. This isn't about um, the community at large, although they'll be looking over our shoulders. We're focusing in on what students would like and what their families need that will keep them growing food and staying well nourished and resilient. So in mapping it, we began with school gardens and then add the community gardens and the farms that support them and the businesses that support them and the markets where they can be reached and then the food banks. So again, they can see the whole picture and Students are learning you know, about the whole food system, but over their shoulder, the community is learning about the whole food system that we have up here. And it's also intended to offer all the links to the farms and the markets so other people coming on can see the production and the distribution. Where this became very important again, when COVID hit, all of a sudden the farmers were out there putting in their seeds and growing out baby lambs and they had no market. But because this food structure is all of a sudden kind of in place, we can now see the CSAs and the places where people could go locally, support our local farmers, and they sold out very quickly because they could see it now and people could draw attention to it. So the final cost for Feed Jeffco, when you look at cost, there was none for the platform because it's served up on Green Maps. The, the uh, organization of it is taken care of. It's open source. As a volunteer, I'm not getting any money. As students, they're probably not getting any money. Um, time it took me, one month, once I got it all organized to put it all together. And we're going to go through that in just a second, step by step, and how I did that organization. The actual risk, no risk to them at all. Um, they had nothing to do before or after the map. Um, if they get nothing else, they've redone, they've, um, they've already organized 
And um, that information where it was just a simple little one uh, map for their holding map website, it's now completely turned into a knowledge bank. And longevity, open source means constant improvement. Now I have, I think when I went skipping on these things, it skipped over a few things here. So I'm going to escape out of this and it did. It flipped through some of my key slides, man. <laughs> like right here, no, not that, um, this guy, we skipped over him. So let's go back to that for just a second. Okay, so here's where I'm talking about organization. It's so critical. Um, we have this little pop-up, uh, kind of a mini, when you go to a site and you click on it, this pops up on the left-hand side of the site. All that content here goes over when you go to expand, comes down to here, and now you see all that content is now in a nice large printable form that if you printed, you get two nice, nice pages that you can give to somebody else. And then it also goes over to these little blurbs that pop up to the very beginning. This is, uh, I put them all together for the sake of a banner, but that content is the same on each one. So as you're, this is where it becomes really important to know what you're gonna talk about first, second, and third, get all that mapped out before you start putting your content together. So you know where it's going to land and then it'll all link together. It'll all be consistent. And with consistency, you have trust. If, they think, if every single site is laid out a little differently, your brain can't quite figure it out. I wanted the schools to be able to see their school compared to another school compared to another school. So maybe a slight competition or the sport of growing food happens and <laughs> people get better at doing it here. Same thing for the food gardens. They're kind of the food bank gardens. They have eight of them here in this little town of 9,000 people. And those eight gardens um, didn't know what everybody else did. So I just put it in little bullet point forms of this garden to this garden to this garden, all looks alike. The other decision I made was anything that's on this map is evergreen information. I do not wanna be in the map maintenance job. I want to put it up here so it's more of a table of contents for the entire community of work when it comes to growing food versus being an end all be all site for information. And that's a decision I made up front. And okay, so with that, um, I'm going to go back to my final slide here, but I have to get out of here if I can. Hmm. This is in the Northwest, everything's probably frozen. <laughs> okay, so the, the final of this, the results, is that became, this became a knowledge portal instead of just a website. The schools can compare fork to fork programs, which they never had before. The students that are most are virtual at this point, but they're starting to take some pride of ownership. The teachers are coming on, taking pride of ownership and what they're doing. The chefs are really glad to see their stuff finally being championed. The food bank gardens are finally getting their consistent talking points and what they're doing. The icons, I can't say enough, have solved the problem of people coming into a program or into a business and thinking it did one thing like Finn River Cidery, oh, it's a cidery, that's all they do. No, they are an event center, they contribute to schools, they have like 10 different functions that they perform in the community that no one didn't know, they didn't know about. So it really helps to intermesh those disciplines and silos. The local papers, magazines, organizations, um, I just point them to the map and all of a sudden they're going, wow, this really is a thing. And now they're giving us articles and um, around in uh, the major magazines, which is kind of nice, uh, Country High Life. And mostly making intangible jobs and services tangible to the public, such as the school cook. Who knows about school cooks? Did you know you're one in high school? Probably not. But they're doing all, they're cooking, they're taking this fresh produce now, instead of out of cans, fresh produce off the farms and turning it into recipes and serving it to kids and making recipes that are also for families of six. So you have the school for 100 recipe and the, the recipe for a family of six and they can go home and continue on growing their own food or buying from the farmer's market and having good fresh, fresh food. And that happened because of all this has been put together. So that's pretty much it for me. And um, I'll take any questions that you have and you're welcome to give me a, an email, you know, shoot an email over to me and I'll work with anybody. I'm open to.
Mary, that was great. And um, you can see we're on our final slide. I'm going to take it down in a minute. Um, but all of us welcome hearing from you directly if you have questions about getting involved in this project. Um, but now we have about 25 minutes. I'm going to take this. Will you stop sharing your screen now? Sure. Thank you. Um, and we have 28 people here. So um, maybe if you want to speak, go ahead. <laughs> or maybe raise your hand. Raise your hand is right under the reactions. And you can raise your hand there if you want. Um, don't be shy. We're happy to um, hear from you. I'm taking a couple screenshots while we're waiting. Um, really, no questions? I'm so amazed. Um, for, you've got us here waiting. I, maybe I see Neil is here, who's been using this platform a little bit from, um, you can unmute yourself if you want to speak, Neil. He's in um, Glasgow, Scotland, and um, maybe you want to add something to this. Uh, yeah, evening everyone. Uh, well, it's probably not evening where everyone is, but it's evening for us. Um, that was really interesting, Mary. Um, I, one question I had was, did you develop any icons yourself or have you just used um, what was what was there or is that something you're looking at? Um, I haven't done my own icons. Um, my goal on this was to get it pretty much 80% there because I was working with a group of people that didn't understand maps. They didn't have time to listen to a presentation or get it. So I was just building it out enough so other people would look at it and get excited. And from there we can go on. And it's nice to know that I can actually build out icons because I'm sure the kids are gonna to wanna to do that. And my next question would be, so we're, well, we, we, it's not me. Glasgow is hosting the COP26 environment talk uh, <laughs> in November. Um, and we have just, uh, we're a partner in a project with the Glasgow Community Food Network. Um, and yeah, we'd be really interested in, so we, we're trying to create a map where well, we are creating a map for um, COP26. And in fact, Joanne, who's the student placement is on, on the call with us. Um, but I'd be interested to see if you'd be interested in a we twinning exercise as part of COP26. Um, sure. Yeah. That'd be amazing. Sure. And you all know COP26. Oh, sorry. It's the UN United Nations Climate Conference. And it's this November. Is that right? Yep. It was postponed that's, a year. Yep, that's correct. And um, it may well be. Food is. A, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say it may well be a Go hybrid ahead. event as well. So people may well be able to access a lot of the talks remotely. Right. To me, food is a gateway to so many other kinds of sustainable practices. I see Mark had his hand up, and I know Mark is an expert in, Mark Schifflet in from New York here is an expert in um, food waste management. To me, that's a big part of all of this as well. Um, I'm ex I don't know if you want to add to this conversation, Mark, as well, but go ahead, Mark, Joanne. Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the I mean, things. Yeah, yeah one of the things we we particularly for a number of the organizations we work for is a real pressing need for uh, event centric mapping. So, in other words, oftentimes we have events occurring, and being able to build something quickly and effectively, because as we all know, Google Maps, while it's it's handy can be very deceptive in terms of what it portrays a, a locality or a neighborhood to be. So you want to be able to create something that engages people, but also highlights some of the things in the community that are important to the community, not a, 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 a chain pharmacy or a Whole Foods or you know all that stuff that um, gets piled into Google Maps. Um, but actually one of the things about mapping, particularly in, with these types of tools and crowdsource, which is really kind of crowdsource mapping, is the, 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 the place where things intersect and particularly boundaries, which can be really important, particularly when it comes to managing uh, municipal governments and tax bases and all that, but also getting information for maps 
that may not be necessarily um, appropriate and can create other problems. Um, like a case in point would be, uh, we have this Twitter account here in New York that, that uh, directs people to where there's uh, interesting wildlife <laughs> uh, in Central Park, which is a sort of a, a, a map in a way, in, in towards it's guiding people towards places and things. But the problem that happens is then you get hundreds of people showing up at a place where they shouldn't be, or it, it isn't healthy for the environment. So I'm just curious if anyone's ever run into those kinds of issues in creating maps. It's kind of these social maps, which can, like I said, they can, they can be really helpful, but on the other end, you have to be really careful in terms of what you portray on those maps. Yeah, that I, I, oh, I would like to ask you a question, but I think if you get in touch with Ken, he has a lot of experience with mapping with this kind of maps, and maybe you can change with him a couple of ideas. Are you are you talking about Ken Josephson at University of Victoria? Yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. he's their crew. Uh, you the geography department there has worked with especially marginalized groups around Victoria, British Columbia for many, many years. And it's really been amazing the kind of maps they produce, such as one focused on early childhood education. It's hard to imagine what it must be like for a very young parent not having any idea of what to do with their child outside, for example. Um, so there's, that's an ex one example. Um, the new Campaigns tool might actually be very useful for you too. Don't you agree, Alexandra and Bogdan? Yeah, I think the campaigns building the form in a certain way can help you. Uh, but I think here to address your concerns, the privacy controls are key. Um, however, it's the map maker's responsibility how they set up their map. So I think it is. Um, not easy to design a map that is well designed and we with the platform we try to offer options for people so if you want to mask the location you can uh, if you all the all the sites that are uh, added are by default private so that you can review the data and not have a noise or uh, whatever um, data with issue that you might get when you open up contributions. So we do try to help uh, give people the tools to mediate the content and to uh, make decisions as to how they want to present it and uh, what what kind of access they want to create. But in the end, um, yeah, it's a, it's a social um, issue. It's a decision you have to make as a person who creates a map, how much information you want to give, what kind of information, what kind of impact uh, that has. And I think a lot of times maps are meant to generate, to trigger action. Um, sometimes uh, they might be nicer as, a, as an artifact to know where the wildlife is, to be able to hear uh, recordings of birds somewhere and to see pictures, but you don't necessarily have to everyone. If everyone goes there, it's not like on the map anymore. Uh, so I guess it's, um, yeah, it's not a technological issue. It's, it's something we need to solve as people. That, that was a good example from Central Park. Now, Joanne, you were about to say something. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that we had discussed the issue that that issue and just like in a different different example of creating a map with like LGBTQ plus safe spaces and like generally like safe spaces, which then if you make that publicly accessible, is that then does that then make these places subject to like unsafety? So that was just like another example that we had discussed that I was going to throw in there. But yeah. 
that's um, maybe that brand new feature that I learned about as you did today, <laughs> where you can make some of the sites less visible is very interesting. Um, that's good. Are there, are there other people here who have some questions or comments? Um, it's not every day that we get the, <laughs> the developers here to um, talk with, and they're very responsive, as you can see. MJT, MTJ, are you, are you adding something? Do I need to unmute here? Go ahead. Hi. Um, sorry. Are you... Were you referring to me? I'm sorry, I have a question, but you may have been asking someone else. No, you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I was, I was communicating with Mary in the chat, but I am working on a map. I'm in upstate New York and uh, Columbia County, but I'm working on a map um, of local farmers, which um, would display their farming practices. My personal interest is humane treatment of animals. But um, there's just such a broad range of different things that farming practices that different farmers um, use or don't use, um, but just to give consumers the option of, of buying meat. This is meat specifically. Um, so it's cruelty free. It can be extended to plants, I think. But um, initially, I'm just going with meat. There are certification programs, but they're, um, the bar is so high and the investment is so steep that most people don't bother with them. So um, the whole collaboration idea is very new to me. I'm a GIS analyst and I've been doing that for a while, but um, so the mapping part, you know, I'm more comfortable with, but I would be interested in expanding this further and collaborating and, and you know, really making it something that um, people can find easily and use in different areas. So I would be interested in just maybe a thumbnail sketch of how, how, what steps I need to do to do that kind of thing. That's my unknown, like how to actually bring it forward. I, I can't help you with that, that we've kind of gone through that whole process between the co-ops and uh, the buying around here, uh, what's, what's organic, what's natural, what's farm raised, what's sensitive, what isn't, you know, all those kind of terms and coming up with something that all the farms can kind of live under. So I'll happy discuss that with you maybe at another time because that gets into another whole. <laughs> so okay, cool. that would be wonderful. Thank you, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Right, and stay in touch because we may be able to, and you can feel free to drop your, um, um, uh, in the, just up in the chat, there's Christian Swen, Swenwinger, who I've met in, who lives up near you in, um, is it Ulster County, I think? who's also been working on uh, farmer's mapping. Oh, Columbia County as well. Um, no kidding. Oh my goodness. No That's kidding. Funny. So it, <laughs> it, is, it is funny. So, and I'm in touch with Christian. If you want to leave your email and name in a private message to me, I can certainly connect you later. Um, I know a lot of us are from the Thank New you. York area, but, um, and, Food is big everywhere. That's a, one of the things we know. But I'm really delighted to see so many people um, and the possibility just coming from this um, one open data day event of really starting to do heavy duty transformation of our food system like Mary has done through mapping. And the COVID came a month or two into her process was incredible. And I watched her pivot and change how this map was gonna work. And really it was just thrilling because this was the perfect kind of case study of how you wanna make a map that's really responsive to local need. So really appreciate how she's laid it out. And of course, having the tool itself here is outstanding. Anybody else wanna comment? <laughs> um, I'll tell you, I worked on a map about energy in New York that took three years to make. And one of the most difficult parts was how do you interpret what's going on so it's available and actionable for, for peop the people who use the map. And to me, this is one of our questions as map makers as well. It's really thinking about those users. And Mary showed how they move the kids to the top of that 
list of who do we want to make this map most useful for. So think about that as you get started. Um, yeah, I yeah, I can I can speak to that a little bit too. I've created um, or create maps for uh, grant recipients, and one of the biggest problems was just having a human being associated with that grant who could be easily contacted, um, because so often projects, you know, as they as they as they happen, in a, you know, which is over the course of a year or two things change. I mean, people change, you know, and, but having a way to update that information easily, it's just was one of the biggest obstacles um, to, because ultimately with these grants, you have to do reporting. And if you don't have that report, then your ability to get more grant or to sustain the program is reduced. So I just found that just having, making sure that there's that human element is always present in some way. So, you know, you can't automate everything. Um, so it's just a matter of having an email address or a contact phone number and a name that is, um, you know, current. So. That's a good example. Um, any other questions or comments from people here today for any of us? <clears throat> or for people in the room. <laughs> um, we're going to be sharing this recording on um, the story page for Open Green Map 2, um, which is um, greenmap.org slash story slash OGM2 in shortly, so you can share it with people. Oh, I through um, the reservation system, I'll send you back a notice when it's posted so you can all have it. Um, we're available. We don't yet have a date for our next um, demonstration and um, discussion, but these are actually really important for the development project. I think all of us agree with that. And you're all welcome to come back and bring your colleagues. Um, last month's meeting um, included I think it was two or three teachers from Israel. The project immediately spread to, they now have a, more than a dozen schools signed up to this fourth grade um, project. And that's really about, you know, place-based education in that case in the city of Hedera. But it can happen really quickly. I believe their goal is to have their map completed by May. And so this is involving dozens and dozens and dozens of kids and their families. So hopefully there'll be some very exciting outcomes there. They're testing the new campaigns with that. And you're working with the platform in Hebrew and English. And by the way, there's um, translation at the top um, right on the platform. And if you're in a country where you're used to changing it, I believe the whole thing changes anyhow. You don't need to do the special script for the back end. Is that correct? Um, Hebrew didn't need to. Um, but if you want to translate that back end for us for your uh, language, you certainly are welcome to. Um, I think we'll, um, anybody else have a last word they want to add here? Bogdan and Alexandra or Mary, anything else you'd like to add? Well, I think we've learned from COVID, the importance of place and where you are and your resources that are immediately around you from here. So I think mapping is going to, in talking to person live, <laughs> you know, finding a reason to get down there and talk to people live face to face. Um, this whole project to me is, has more meaning now than it did before COVID. Thank you, Mary. Maybe I can also say thanks for joining us and um, as I said, this platform that we are working on is open source. We're very open to getting feedback from people who want to solve problems using it. So please get in touch if um, you have, you, you can make use of it. Thanks. And do, uh, and um, we're looking forward to seeing the other purposing of this platform, the Honeybee program as well, and um, how that develops in Europe and elsewhere. I won't say too much about that, but it's on your website, is that right? 
Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay. But it's coming. It's all coming, folks. And the mapping will make it all um, hopefully more inclusive and accessible and actionable for everybody. I hope so. Any last word, Bogdan? No, thank you all for joining, joining us. And I hope we'll see each other at the next event that we'll have. Thank you, everybody. Be well um, and happy mapping. Happy Open Data Week. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, Wendy. Great show. Thanks, Mark. You were great. Thank you. <laughs>